more years ago than anybody can remember. Before the first hotel had been built, or the first Englishman had taken a photograph of Mont Blanc and brought it home to be pasted in an album and shown after tea to his envious friends, Switzerland belonged to the Emperor of Austria to do what he liked with. One of the first things the Emperor did was to send his friend Hermann Gessler to govern the country. Gessler was not a nice man, and it soon became plain that he would never make himself really popular with the Swiss. The point on which they disagreed in particular was the question of taxes. The Swiss, who were a simple and thrifty people, objected to paying taxes of any sort. They said they wanted to spend their money on all kinds of other things. Gessler, on the other hand, wished to put a tax on everything, and being governor, he did it. He made everyone who owned a flock of sheep pay a certain sum of money to him, and if the farmer sold his sheep and bought cows, he had to pay rather more money to Gessler for the cows than he had paid for the sheep. Gessler also taxed bread and biscuits and jam and buns and lemonade, and in fact, everything he could think of, till the people of Switzerland determined to complain. They appointed Walter Fürst, who had red hair and looked fierce, Werner Stoffacher, who had gray hair and was always wondering how he ought to pronounce his name, and Arnold of Melchthal, who had light yellow hair and was supposed to know a great deal about the law, to make the complaint. They called on the governor one lovely morning in April, and were shown into the hall of audience. "'Well,' said Gessler, "'and what's the matter now?' The other two pushed Walter first forward because he looked fierce, and they thought he might frighten the governor. Walter first coughed. "'Well,' asked Gessler. "'Ahem, ahem,' said Walter first. "'That's the way,' whispered Werner. "'Give it him.' Uh, ahem, said Walter first again. The fact is your governorship. It's a small point, interrupted Gessler, but I'm generally called your excellency. Yes. Uh, the fact is your excellency. It seems to the people of Switzerland. Whom I represent whispered Arnold of Melkthal, whom I represent, that things want changing. What things? inquired Gessler. The taxes, your excellent governorship. Change the taxes. Why, don't the people of Switzerland think there are enough taxes? Arnold of Melchthal broke in hastily. They think there are many too many, he said. What with the tax on sheep, and the tax on cows, and the tax on bread, and the tax on tea, and the tax— I know, I know, Gessler interrupted. I know all the taxes. Come to the point. What about them? Well, Your Excellency, there are too many of them. Too many. Yes, and we are not going to put up with it any longer, shouted Arnold of Melchthal. Gessler leaned forward in his throne. Might I ask you to repeat that remark? he said. We are not going to put up with it any longer. Gessler sat back again with an ugly smile. Oh, he said. Oh, indeed, you art, aren't you? Desire the Lord High Executioner to step this way, he added to a soldier who stood beside him. The Lord High Executioner entered the presence. He was a kind-looking old gentleman with white hair, 
and he wore a beautiful black robe, tastefully decorated with death's heads. "'Your Excellency sent for me?' he said. "'Just so,' replied Gessler. "'This gentleman here,' he pointed to Arnold of Melchthal, "'says he does not like taxes, and that he isn't going to put up with them any longer.' "'Tut, tut!' murmured the executioner. "'See what you can do for him.' "'Certainly, Your Excellency. "'Robert!' he cried. "'Is the oil on the boil?' Uh, "'Just this minute boiled over,' replied a voice from the other side of the door. "'Then bring it in, and mind you don't spill any.' "'Enter Robert.' in a suit of armour and a black mask, carrying a large cauldron, from which the steam rose in great clouds. "'Now, sir, if you please,' said the executioner politely to Arnold of Melchthal. Arnold looked at the cauldron. "'Why, it's hot!' he said. "'Warmish,' admitted the executioner. "'It's against the law to threaten a man with hot oil.' "'You may bring an action against me,' said the executioner. "'Now, sir, if you please, we are wasting time. "'The forefinger of your left hand, if I may trouble you. "'Thank you. I am obliged.' "'He took Arnold's left hand and dipped the tip of the first finger into the oil. "'Ow!' cried Arnold, jumping. "'Don't let him see he's hurting you,' whispered Werner Stauffacher. "'Pretend you don't notice it.' Gessler leaned forward again. "'Have your views on taxes changed at all?' he asked. "'Do you see my point of view more clearly now?' Arnold admitted that he thought that, after all, there might be something to be said for it. "'That's right,' said the governor. "'And the tax on sheep? You don't object to that?' "'No.' "'And the tax on cows? I like it.' "'And those on bread and buns and lemonade? I enjoy them.' "'Excellent.' "'In fact, you're quite contented.' "'Quite.' "'And you think the rest of the people are?' "'Oh, quite, quite.' "'And do you think the same?' he asked of Walter and Werner. "'Oh, yes, Your Excellency,' they cried. "'Then that's all right,' said Gessler. I was sure you would be sensible about it. Now, if you will kindly place in the tambourine which the gentleman on my left is presenting to you a mere trifle to compensate us for our trouble in giving you an audience, and if you, to Arnold of Melchthal, will contribute an additional trifle for use of the imperial boiling oil, I think we shall all be satisfied." You've done it. That's right. Good-bye, and mind the step as you go out. And, as he finished this speech, the three spokesmen of the people of Switzerland were shown out of the hall of audience. CHAPTER Two. They were met in the street outside by a large body of their fellow-citizens, who had accompanied them to the palace, and who had been spending the time since their departure in listening by turns at the keyhole of the front door. But as the hall of audience was at the other side of the palace, and cut off from the front door by two other doors, a flight of stairs, and a long passage, they had not heard very much of what had gone on inside, and they surrounded the three spokesmen as they came out, and questioned them eagerly. "'Has he taken off the tax on jam?' asked Ulrich the smith. 
What is he going to do about the tax on mixed biscuits? shouted Klaus von der Flew, who was a chimney sweep of the town and loved mixed biscuits. Never mind about tea and mixed biscuits, cried his neighbor, Meyer of Sarnen. What I want to know is whether we shall have to pay for keeping sheep any more. What did the governor say? asked Jost Weiler, a practical man, who liked to go straight to the point. The three spokesmen looked at one another a little doubtfully. Well, said Werner Stoffacher at last, as a matter of fact, he didn't actually say very much. It was more what he did, if you understand me, than what he said. I should describe His Excellency the Governor, said Walter first, as a man who has got away with him, a man who has got all sorts of arguments at his fingertips. At the mention of fingertips, Arnold of Melchthal uttered a sharp howl. In short, continued Walter, after a few minutes' very interesting conversation, he made us see that it really wouldn't do, and that we must go on paying the taxes as before. There was a dead silence for several minutes, while everybody looked at everybody else in dismay. The silence was broken by Arnold of Sewa. Arnold of Sewa had been disappointed at not being chosen as one of the three spokesmen, and he thought that if he had been so chosen, all this trouble would not have occurred. The fact is, he said bitterly, that you three have failed to do what you were sent to do. I mention no names, far from it, but I don't mind saying that there are some people in this town who would have given a better account of themselves. What you want in little matters of this sort is, if I may say so, tact. Tact, that's what you want. Of course, if you will go rushing into the governor's presence. But we didn't rush, said Walter first. Shouting out that you want the taxes abolished. But we didn't shout, said Walter first. I really cannot speak if I am to be constantly interrupted, said Arnold of Sewa severely. What I say is that you ought to employ tact. Tact, that's what you want. If I had been chosen to represent the Swiss people in this affair, I am not saying I ought to have been, mind you. I merely say, if I had been, I should have acted rather after the following fashion. Walking firmly, but not defiantly, into the tyrant's presence, I should have broken the ice with some pleasant remark about the weather. The conversation once started, the rest would have been easy. I should have said that I hoped His Excellency had enjoyed a good dinner, once on the subject of food, and it would have been the simplest of tasks to show him how unnecessary taxes on food were and the whole affair would have been pleasantly settled while you waited. I do not imply that the Swiss people would have done better to have chosen me as their representative. I merely say that this is how I should have acted had they done so. And Arnold of Sewa twirled his mustache and looked offended. His friends instantly suggested that they should be allowed to try where the other three had failed, and the rest of the crowd, beginning to hope once more, took up the cry. The result was that the visitor's bell of the palace was rung for the second time. Arnold of Sewa went in, and the door was banged behind him. Five minutes later he came out, sucking the first finger of his left hand. No, he said, it can't be done. The tyrant has convinced me. I knew he would, 
said Arnold of Melchthal. "'Then I think you might have warned me,' snapped Arnold of Sewa, dancing with the pain of his burnt finger. "'Was it hot? Boiling! Ah! "'Then he really won't let us off the taxes?' asked the crowd in disappointed voices. "'No! Then the long and short of it is,' said Walter first, drawing a deep breath, "'that we must rebel!' "'Rebel!' cried everybody. "'Rebel!' repeated Walter firmly. "'We will!' cried everybody. "'Down with the tyrant!' shouted Walter first. "'Down with the taxes!' shrieked the crowd. A scene of great enthusiasm followed. The last words were spoken by Werner Stoffacher. "'We want a leader,' he said. "'I don't wish to thrust myself forward,' began Arnold of Sewa. "'But I must say, if it comes to leading—' "'And I know the very man for the job,' said Werner Stoffacher. "'William Tell!' "'Hurrah for William Tell!' roared the crowd, and, taking the time from Werner Stoffacher, they burst into the grand old Swiss chant which runs as follows. "'For he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, and so see all of us.' and having sung this till they were all quite hoarse, they went off to their beds to get a few hours' sleep before beginning the labours of the day. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 In a picturesque little chalet high up in the mountains, covered with snow and edelweiss, which is a flower that grows in the Alps, and you are not allowed to pick it, dwelt William Tell, his wife Hedwig, and his two sons, Walter and William. Such a remarkable man was Tell, that I think I must devote a whole chapter to him and his exploits. There was really nothing he could not do. He was the best shot with the crossbow in the whole of Switzerland. He had the courage of a lion, the sure-footedness of a wild goat, the agility of a squirrel, and a beautiful beard. If you wanted someone to hurry across desolate ice-fields and leap from crag to crag after a chamois, Tell was the man for your money. If you wanted a man to say rude things to the governor, it was to Tell that you applied first. Once, when he was hunting in the wild ravine of Shesh and Thal, where people were hardly ever to be seen, he met the governor face to face. There was no way of getting past. On one side the rocky wall rose sheer up, while below the river roared. Directly Gesser caught sight of Tell striding along with his crossbow, his cheeks grew pale and his knees tottered and he sat down on a rock, feeling very unwell indeed. "'Aha!' said Tell. "'Oho! So it's you, is it? I know you. And a nice sort of person you are, with your taxes on bread and sheep, aren't you? You'll come to a bad end one of these days. That's what will happen to you. Oh, you old reprobate! Pooh! and he had passed on with a look of scorn, leaving Gessler to think over what he had said. And Gessler ever since had had a grudge against him, and was only waiting for a chance of paying him out. "'Mark my words,' said Tell's wife, Hedwig, when her husband told her about it after supper that night, "'Mark my words, he will never forgive you.' "'I will avoid him,' said Tell. "'He will not seek me.' "'Well, mind you do,' was Hedwig's reply. 
On another occasion, when the governor's soldiers were chasing a friend of his, called Baumgarten, and when Baumgarten's only chance of escape was to cross the lake during a fierce storm, and when the ferryman, sensibly remarking, "'What, must I rush into the jaws of death? No man that hath his senses would do that!' refused to take out his boat even for twice his proper fare, and when the soldiers rode down to seize their prey with dreadful shouts, Tell jumped into the boat, and, rowing with all his might, brought his friend safe across after a choppy passage, which made Gessler the governor still more angry with him. But it was as a marksman that Tell was so extraordinary." There was nobody in the whole of the land who was half so skillful. He attended every meeting for miles around where there was a shooting competition, and every time he won first prize. Even his rivals could not help praising his skills. Behold, they would say, Tell is quite the pot-hunter, meaning by the last word, a man who always went in for every prize and always won it. And Tell would say, Yes, truly am I a pot-hunter, for I hunt to fill the family pot. And so he did. He never came home empty-handed from the chase. Sometimes it was a chamois that he brought back, and then the family had it roasted on the first day, cold on the next four, and minced on the sixth, with sippets of toast around the edge of the dish. Sometimes it was only a bird, as on the cover of this book, and then Hedwig would say, Mark my words, this fowl will not go round. But it always did, and it never happened that there was not even a fowl to eat. In fact, Tell and his family lived a very happy, contented life, in spite of the Governor Gessler and his taxes. Tell was very patriotic. He always believed that some day the Swiss would rise and rebel against the tyranny of the governor, and he used to drill his two children so as to keep them always in a state of preparation. They would march about, beating tin cans and shouting, and altogether enjoying themselves immensely, though Hedwig, who did not like noise, and wanted Walter and William to help her with the housework, made frequent complaints. "'Mark my words,' she would say, "'this growing spirit of militarism in the young and foolish will lead to no good,' meaning that boys who played at soldiers instead of helping their mother to dust the chairs and scrub the kitchen floor would in all probability come to a bad end.' But Tell would say, Who hopes to fight his way through life must be prepared to wield arms. Carry on, my boys. And they carried on. It was to this man that the Swiss people had determined to come for help. Chapter 4 Talking matters over in the inn of the town, the glass and glacier, the citizens came to the conclusion that they ought to appoint three spokesmen to go and explain to Tell just what they wanted him to do. "'I don't wish to seem to boast at all,' said Arnold of Sewa, "'but I think I had better be one of the three. "'I was thinking,' said Werner Saufacher, "'that it would be a pity always to be chopping and changing.' Why not choose the same three as were sent to Gessler? I don't desire to be unpleasant at all, replied Arnold of Sewa, but I must be forgiven for reminding the honorable gentleman who has just spoken that he and his equally honorable friends did not meet with the best of success when they called upon the governor. Well, and you didn't either snapped Arnold of Melchthal, whose fingers still hurt him, and made him a little bad-tempered. "'That,' said Arnold of Sewa, "'I put down entirely to the fact that you and your friends, by not exercising tact, 
irritated the governor, and made him unwilling to listen to anybody else. Nothing is more important in these affairs than tact. That's what you want, tact. But have it your own way. Don't mind me. And the citizens did not. They chose Werner Stauffacher, Arnold of Melchthal, and Walter First, and, having drained their glasses, the three trudged up the steep hill which led to Tell's house. It had been agreed that everyone should wait at the glass and glacier until the three spokesmen returned, in order that they might hear the result of their mission. Everybody was very anxious. A revolution without Tell would be quite impossible, and it was not unlikely that Tell might refuse to be their leader. The worst of a revolution is that, if it fails, the leader is always executed as an example to the rest. And many people object to being executed, however much it may set a good example to their friends. On the other hand, Tell was a brave man and a patriot, and might be only too eager to try to throw off the tyrant's yoke, whatever the risk. They had waited about an hour when they saw the three spokesmen coming down the hill. Tell was not with them, a fact which made the citizens suspect that he had refused their offer. The first thing a man does when he has accepted the leadership of a revolution is to come in plot with his companions. Well, said everybody eagerly, as the three arrived. Werner Stauffacher shook his head. Ah! said Arnold of Sewa. I see what it is. He has refused. You didn't exercise tact, and he refused. We did exercise tact, said Stauffacher indignantly. But he would not be persuaded. It was like this. We went to the house and knocked at the door. Tell opened it. Good morning, I said. Good morning, said he. Take a seat. I took a seat. My heart is full, I said, and longs to speak with you. I thought that a neat way of putting it. The company murmured approval. A heavy heart, said Tell, will not grow light with words. Not bad, that, murmured Jostweiler. Clever way of putting things, Tell has got. Yet words, I said, might lead us on to deeds. Neat, said Jost Weiler. Very neat, yes. To which Tell's extraordinary reply was, The only thing to do is to sit still. What? I said. Bear in silence things unbearable? Yes, said Tell. To peaceable men, Peace is gladly granted. When the governor finds that his oppression does not make us revolt, he will grow tired of oppressing. And what did you say to that? asked Ulrich the smith. I said he did not know the governor if he thought he would ever grow tired of oppressing. We might do much, I said, if we held fast together. Union is strength. I said. The strong, said Tell, is strongest when he stands alone. Then our country must not count on thee, I said, when in despair she stands on self-defense. Oh, well, he said, hardly that, perhaps. I don't want to desert you. What I mean to say is, I'm no use as a plotter or a counsellor or that sort of thing. Where I come out strong is in deeds. So don't invite me to your meetings and make me speak and that sort of thing. But if you want a man to do anything, why, that's where I shall come in, you see. Just write it if you want me. A postcard will do, and you will not find William Tell hanging back, no sir. And with those words he showed us out. Well, said Jostweiler, I call that encouraging. All we have to do now is to plot. Let us plot. Yes, let's, 
shouted everybody. Ulrich the smith rapped for silence on the table. Gentlemen, he said, our friend Mr. Klaus von der Flue will now read a paper on governors, their drawbacks, and how to get rid of them. Silence, gentlemen, please. Now then, Klaus, old fellow, speak up and get it over. And the citizens settled down without further delay to a little serious plotting. End of chapter, f chapter 5 A few days after this, Hedwig gave Tell a good talking to on the subject of his love for adventure. He was sitting at the door of his house, mending an axe. Hedwig, as usual, was washing up. Walter and William were playing with a little crossbow not far off. "'Father,' said Walter. "'Yes, my boy.' "'My bowstring has bust.' "'Bust was what all Swiss boys said when they meant broken. "'You must mend it yourself, my boy,' said Tell. "'A sportsman always helps himself.' "'What I say,' said Hedwig, bustling out of the house, "'is that a boy of his age has no business to be shooting. I don't like it. "'Nobody can shoot well if he does not begin to practice early. "'Why, when I was a boy, I remember on one occasion when—' "'What I say,' interrupted Hedwig, is that a boy ought not to want always to be shooting at what not. He ought to stay at home and help his mother, and I wish you would set them a better example. Well, the fact is, you know, said Tell, I don't think nature meant me to be a stay-at-home and that sort of thing. I couldn't be a herdsman if you paid me. I shouldn't know what to do. No, everyone has his special line, and mine is hunting. Now I can hunt. A nasty, dangerous occupation, said Hedwig. I don't like to hear of your being lost on desolate ice fields and leaping from crag to crag and what not. Some day, mark my words, if you are not careful, you will fall down a precipice or be overtaken by an avalanche, or the ice will break while you are crossing it. There are a thousand ways in which you might get hurt. A man of ready wit with a quick eye, replied Tell complacently, never gets hurt. The mountain has no terror for her children. I am a child of the mountain. You are certainly a child, snapped Hedwig. It is of no use my arguing with you. <laughs> Not very much, agreed Tell, for I am just off to the town. I have an appointment with your papa and some other gentlemen. I forgot to say so before, but Hedwig was the daughter of Walter first. Now what are you and papa plotting? asked Hedwig. I know there is something going on. I suspected it when Papa brought Werner Stoffacher and the other man here, and you wouldn't let me listen. What is it? Some dangerous scheme, I suppose? Now how in the world do you get those sort of ideas into your head? Tell laughed. Dangerous scheme? As if I should plot dangerous schemes with your Papa. I know, said Hedwig. You can't deceive me. There is a plot afoot against the governor, and you are in it. A man must help his country. They're sure to place you where there is most danger. I know them. Don't go. Send Walter down with a note to say that you regret that an unfortunate previous engagement, which you have just recollected, will make it impossible for you to accept their kind invitation to plot. No, I must go. And there is another thing, continued Hedwig. Gessler the governor is in the town now. He goes away today. Well, wait till he is gone. 
You must not meet him. He bears you malice. To me his malice cannot do much harm. I do what's right and fear no enemy. Those who do right, said Hedwig, are those he hates the most. And you know he has never forgiven you for speaking like that when you met him in the ravine. Keep away from the town for to-day. Do anything else. Go hunting, if you will. No, said Tell. I promised. I must go. Come along, Walter. You aren't going to take that poor, dear child. Come here, Walter, directly this minute. Want to go with father, said Walter, beginning to cry, for his father had promised to take him with him the next time he went to the town, and he had saved his pocket money for the occasion. Oh, let the boy come, said Tell. William will stay with you, won't you, William? All right, father, said William. Well, mark my words, said Hedwig. If something bad does not happen, I shall be surprised. Oh, no, said Tell. What can happen? And without further delay he set off with Walter for the town. CHAPTER Six. In the meantime all kinds of things of which Tell had no suspicion had been happening in the town. The fact that there were no newspapers in Switzerland at that time often made him a little behindhand as regarded the latest events. He had to depend, as a rule, on visits from his friends, who would sit in his kitchen and tell him all about everything that had been going on for the last few days. And, of course, when there was anything very exciting happening in the town, nobody had time to trudge up the hill to tell chalet. They all wanted to be in the town, enjoying the fun. What had happened now was this. It was the chief amusement of the governor, Gessler, who, you will remember, was not a nice man. When he had a few moments to spare from the cares of governing, to sit down and think out some new way of annoying the Swiss people. He was one of those persons who only do it to annoy because they know it teases. What he liked chiefly was to forbid something. He would find out what the people most enjoyed doing, and then he would send a herald to say that he was very sorry, but it must stop. He found that this annoyed the Swiss more than anything. But now he was rather puzzled what to do, for he had forbidden everything he could think of. He had forbidden dancing and singing, and playing on any sort of musical instrument, on the ground that these things made such a noise, and disturbed people who wanted to work. He had forbidden the eating of everything except bread, and the simplest sorts of meat, because he said that anything else upset people, and made them unfit to do anything except sit still and say how ill they were. And he had forbidden all sorts of games, because he said they were a waste of time. So that now, when he wanted dreadfully to forbid something else, he could not think of anything. Then he had an idea and this was it. He told his servants to cut a long pole, and they cut a very long pole. Then he said to them, Go into the hall and bring me one of my hats, not my best hat, which I wear on Sundays and on state occasions, nor yet my second best, which I wear every day, nor yet, again, the one I wear when I am out hunting, for all these I need. Fetch me, rather, the oldest of my hats. And they fetched him the very oldest of his hats. Then he said, Put it on top of the pole. And they put it right on top of the pole. And last of all, he said, Go and set up the pole in the middle of the meadow, just outside the gates of the town. And they went 
and set up the pole in the very middle of the meadow, just outside the gates of the town. Then he sent his heralds out to north and south, and east and west, to summon the people together, because he said he had something very important and special to say to them. And the people came in tens, and fifties, and hundreds, men, women, and children, and they stood waiting in front of the palace steps till Gessler the governor should come out and say something very important and special to them. And punctually at eleven o'clock, Gessler, having finished a capital breakfast, came out to the top step and spoke to them. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he began, a voice from the crowd, "'Speak up!' "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he began again in a louder voice, "'if I could catch the man who said speak up, I would have bitten in the neck by wild elephants.' Applause. "'I have called you to this place to-day to explain to you my reason for putting up a pole on the top of which is one of my caps in the meadow just outside the city gates. It is this. You all, I know, respect and love me.' Here he paused for the audience to cheer, but as they remained quite silent, he went on. You would all, I know, like to come to my palace every day and do reverence to me. A voice. No, no! If I could catch the man who said no, no, I would have him stung on the soles of the feet by pink scorpions. And if he was the same man who said speak up a little while ago, the number of scorpions should be doubled. Loud applause. As I was saying before I was interrupted, I know you would like to come to my palace and do reverence to me there. But, as you are many and space is limited, I am obliged to refuse you that pleasure. However, being anxious not to disappoint you, I have set up my cap in the meadow, and you may do reverence to that. In fact, you must. Everybody is to look on that cap as if it were me. A voice. It ain't so ugly as you. If I could catch the man who made that remark, I would have him tied up and teased by trained blue bottles. Deafening applause. In fact, to put the matter briefly, if anybody crosses that meadow without bowing down before that cap, my soldiers will arrest him, and I will have him pecked on the nose by infuriated blackbirds. So there! Soldiers, move that crowd on! And Gessler disappeared indoors again, just as a volley of eggs and cabbages whistled through the air and the soldiers began to hustle the crowd down the various streets till the open space in front of the palace gates were quite cleared of them. All this happened the day before Tell and Walter set out for the town. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 Having set up the pole and cap in the meadow, Gessler sent two of his bodyguard, Frieshard. I should think you would be safe in pronouncing this Freeze hard, but you had better ask somebody who knows. And Luthold, to keep watch there all day, and see that nobody passed by without kneeling down before the pole and taking off his hat to it. But the people, who prided themselves on being what they called open sie schnuffen, or, as we should say, up to snuff, and equal to every occasion, had already seen a way out of the difficulty. They knew that if they crossed the meadow, they must bow down before the pole, which they did not want to do, so it occurred to them that an ingenious way of preventing this would be not to cross the meadow. So they went the long way round, 
and the two soldiers spent a lonely day. "'What I says,' said Frieshart, "'is what's the use of us wasting our time here?' Frieshart was not a very well-educated man, and he did not speak good grammar. "'None of these here people ain't a-going to bow down to that there hat. "'A course they ain't. "'Why, I can remember the time when this meadow was like a fair. "'Everybody a-shovin' and a-jostlin' one another for elbow-room. "'And look at it now. "'It's a desert. "'That's what it is, a desert. "'What's the good of us wasting of our time here?' I says. "'That's what I says.' "'And they're artful, too, mind you,' he continued. "'Why, only this morning I says to myself, "'Freeze hard,' I says. "'You just wait till twelve o'clock,' I says, "'cause that's when they leave the council house, "'and then they'll have to cross the meadow. "'And then we'll see what we shall see,' I says. "'Like that,' I says. "'Bitter like, you know. "'We'll see,' I says.' what we shall see. So I waited, and at twelve o'clock out they came, dozens of em, and began to cross the meadow. And now, says I to myself, look out for larks. But what happened? Why, when they came to the pole, the priest stood in front of it, and the sacristan rang the bell, and they all fell down on their knees, and they were saying their prayers, not doing obeisance to the hat. That's what they were doing. Artful, that's what they are. And Frieshart kicked the foot of the pole viciously with his iron boot. It's my belief, said Luthold. Luthold is the thin soldier you see in the picture. It's my firm belief that they are laughing at us. There, listen to that. A voice made itself heard from behind a rock not far off. "'Where did you get that hat?' said the voice. "'There,' grumbled Luthold. "'They're always at it. Last time it was, "'Who's your hatter? "'Why, we're the laughing-stock of the place. "'We're like two rogues in a pillory. "'Tis rank disgrace for one who wears a sword to stand as sentry o'er an empty hat, to make obeisance to a hat. In faith, such a command is downright foolery.' "'Well,' said Frieshart, "'and why not bow before an empty hat? Thou hast often bowed before an empty skull. <laughs> I was always one for a joke, you know.' "'Here comes some people,' said Luthold. "'At last! And they're only the rabble, after all. "'You don't catch any the better sort of people coming here.' A crowd was beginning to collect on the edge of the meadow. Its numbers swelled every minute, until quite a hundred of the commoner sort must have been gathered together. They stood pointing at the pole and talking among themselves, but nobody made any movement to cross the meadow. At last someone shouted, "Yah!" The soldiers took no notice. Someone else cried, Boo! Pass along there, pass along, said the soldiers. Cries of, Where did you get that hat? began to come from the body of the crowd. When the Swiss invented a catchphrase, they did not drop it in a hurry. "'Where did you get that hat?' they shouted. Frieshart and Luthold stood like two statues in armor, paying no attention to the remarks of the rabble. This annoyed the rabble. They began to be more personal. "'You in the second-hand lobster tin!' shouted one. He meant Frieshart, whose suit of armor, though no longer new, hardly deserved this description. "'Who's your hatter?' "'Can't you see?' shouted a friend, when Frieshart made no reply. "'The poor thing ain't alive. He's stuffed!' 
Roars of laughter greeted this sally. Friesheart, in spite of the fact that he enjoyed a joke, turned pink. "'He's blushing!' shrieked the voice. Friesheart turned purple. Then things got still more exciting. "'Ear!' said a rough voice in the crowd impatiently. "'What's the good of talking to em? Give me that ear egg, missus!' And in another instant an egg flew across the meadow and burst over Luthold's shoulder. The crowd howled with delight. This was something like fun, thought they, and the next moment eggs, cabbages, cats, and missiles of every sort darkened the air. The two soldiers raved and shouted, but did not dare to leave their post. At last, just as the storm was at its height, it ceased as if by magic. Everyone in the crowd turned round, and, as they turned, jumped into the air and waved his hat. A deafening cheer went up. Hurrah! cried the mob. Here comes good old Tell. Now there's going to be a jolly row.